All right. I hope you're joining uh, me tonight as we're having some bad weather. So uh, hopefully you'll enjoy getting to watch this message uh, for life for tonight. Uh, tonight's message is three realizations for believers to be rich and blessed from Revelation 2, 1 through 17. Have you ever felt like you know someone really well, but then they share something with you that totally surprises you? This goes to show you that even with people we think we know, there's still much to learn. In the passage for tonight, we're going to see that Jesus knows his churches very, very well. The book of Revelation contains Jesus' seven letters to seven churches scattered throughout Asia Minor. As a general rule, each of the letters contains the following elements. A description of the church receiving the letter, a compliment or encouragement for something they do well, a critique where a church is falling short of its calling role, and a command to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Some letters are missing one of the elements, and some have extra, but Jesus' message to each church is specific, knowledgeable, and individualized. Like Paul's letters to the specific congregations throughout his ministry area, these letters would have been carried to the intended churches. So, just think about these questions tonight. Have you ever felt like you don't love Jesus the same way as when you became a believer? Do you struggle with the world and its temptations pulling at you to compromise your faith? Is it challenging for you to cling to Jesus in the midst of persecution or trials that maybe you're going through? So to help you with these questions, we're going to look at three realizations for believers to be rich and blessed from Revelation 2, 1 through 17. Let's pray. God, I just pray that you will help each one of us to understand the message that you have for us today. God, I pray that you'll be lifted up and glorified. God, I pray that you would speak to each person's heart as they hear this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Believers need to realize that loving Jesus more than anything and repentance are what is required. It's the first point. It's from Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Let's look at this together. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found to be them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, in each of these seven letters, we'll see Jesus' command to write for John to write to the angel at each church. This angel might refer to some sort of guardian angel, some church representative uh, in the spiritual realm, or perhaps some type of human leader of the church. You see, the Ephesians were commanded and commended for their hard work, their endurance, and for identifying those false prophets and their intolerance of evil, even in the face of hardship. In general, this church had continued in its faithful service to God for more than 40 years. You know, First Baptist Colony is over 40 years old. That's kind of how long this is talking about. However, this busy, separated, sacrificing church really suffered from some heart trouble. They had abandoned their first love, which was a love for Jesus Christ himself. They displayed works, labor, and patience. But these qualities were not motivated by, motivated by a love for Christ. What we do for the Lord is important, but so is why we do it. So why do you do the things that you do in serving the Lord? It's the devotion to Christ that so often characterizes the new believer. A love that's passionate, personal, uninhibited, excited, and openly displayed. Think back to when you came to know Christ if you're a believer. Is that how it was for you? Were you passionate? Was it very personal to you? Were you uninhibited? Were you excited? Did you want to tell others about what happened? Did you openly display your faith? Think of it kind of like honeymoon love. It's like that of a husband and wife when they are on their honeymoon. While it's true that mature married love deepens and grows deeper. 
It's also true that it should never lose that excitement and wonder of those honeymoon days. When a husband and wife begin to take each other for granted and life becomes routine, then the marriage is in danger. And that's the same thing that happens with us in our relationship with Christ. It can become in danger. Just think of it. It is possible to serve, sacrifice, and suffer for my name's sake, and yet not really love Jesus Christ. The Ephesian believers were so busy maintaining their separation that they were neglecting adoration. Labor is no substitute for love, and neither is purity a substitute for passion. The church must have both if it is to please Christ. It is only as we love Christ eagerly that we can serve him faithfully. Our love for him must be pure. Ephesians 6.24 says, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Understanding their shortcomings, the Ephesians were instructed to remember and repent. You see, first love can be restored if we follow these three instructions that Christ gave the Ephesians about their shortcomings. <clears throat> first, we must remember. Literally, keep on remembering what we have lost and cultivate the desire to regain that close communion again, once again. That's where we remember those days when we first came to know Christ. Then we must repent. We must change our minds and confess our sins to the Lord where we've forsaken and not followed him with true love. Then we must repeat the first works, which is suggest restoring the original fellowship that was broken by our sin or neglect in this first love. For the believer, this means prayer, Bible reading, meditation, obedient service, and worship. Getting back to the things that God's called us to. In spite of the privileges it had enjoyed, the church, it had enjoyed, the church of Ephesus was in danger of losing its life. The church that loses its love will soon lose its life, no matter how doctrinally sound we may be. And the same can happen for our church. The same can happen with us. <clears throat> These are great words for us. Remember Jesus' love for us and our love for him. Repent regularly of not living in that perfect love and repeat the first works. In Revelation 2, 6, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The word Nicolaitan means to conquer the people. Some Bible students believe this was a sect who lorded it over the church and robbed the people of their liberty in Christ. They initiated what we know as the clergy or laity. You may have heard that, for, that word, there's the clergy or the laity. It was kind of a false division that is taught nowhere in the New Testament. So all of us as believers, we are actually kingdom and priests and have equal access to the Father through the blood of Christ. We don't have to have a priest. We don't have to have clergy to be a part of having access to God. So in application... Are you guilty of losing your first love for Christ like the Ephesians? Have you lost that first love? Have you repented of not loving Christ like you did when you got saved? What is your motivation for serving Christ in his church? Is it pure? Make sure you take some time to answer these questions. Maybe write down your answers on some paper. So, believers need to realize that loving Jesus more than anything and repentance are what is required. The next realization, <clears throat> point two, is believers need to realize that God's idea of richness and blessing don't fit the world's definition. We get this from Revelation 2, 8 and 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. For ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So, Believers need to realize that God's idea of richness and blessing don't fit the world's definition. How do we come to this? Christ described himself as the first and the last who died and came to life. Christ is portrayed as the eternal one who suffered death at the hands of his persecutors and then was resurrected from the grave. And we praise the Lord for that. He resurrected. That's what gives us life. That's what's different for us as believers. 
These aspects of Christ were especially relevant to the believers at Smyrna, who, like Christ in his death, were experiencing severe persecution. So Christ knew what this persecution was all about. As a matter of fact, the name of the city, Smyrna, means myrrh, or an ordinary perfume. You may remember that when the, uh, with the wise men bringing frankincense and myrrh. Uh, it was also used as an anointing oil of the tabernacle and embalming dead bodies. While the believers of the church of Smyrna were experiencing the bitterness of suffering, their faithful testimony was like myrrh or a sweet perfume to God. So it was a fragrant aroma to God here. The church in Smyrna was struggling as they were being persecuted, persecuted in many ways. So much so that their daily lives and their ability to earn a living were, were suffering. They just couldn't make the money that they needed to because of the suffering and, and the persecution. We know from verse 9 that it was a comfort to believers in Smyrna to know that Christ knew all about their sufferings. Just like Christ knows all about your sufferings, your pain, your hurt. Besides suffering persecution, the believers in Smyrna were also in, enduring extreme poverty. I'm not sure if any of us have experienced this so much, but they were extremely poor. They were rich in wonderful promises Christ had given them, but they were poor. They were being persecuted not only by the pagan Gentiles, but also by the hostile Jews and by Satan himself. Apparently, the local Jewish synagogue was called the synagogue of Satan. Yet in light of all this, Jesus called them rich. And he told them not to be afraid, as a great reward was theirs for staying faithful. There is a reward for that faithfulness. So believers are encouraged to be faithful by contemplating what awaits after them after death, namely eternal life. We have eternal life. Even if they died, they would receive the crown of life, and that's what we will receive. They will enter into eternal life that would never end. You see, uh, to the people in that day, the crown of life, it's the winner's crown awarded at the annual athletic games. Smyrna was a key participant in the games, so the, this promise would be especially meaningful to believers living there. The Lord reinforced the promise given by James 1.12, and he assured his people that there was nothing to fear. Because they had trusted him, they were overcomers, victors in the race of faith. And as overcomers, they had nothing to fear, and we have nothing to fear. Even if they were martyred, they would be ushered into glory wearing crowns, the crown of life. Where do we see more about this? We see this in Hebrews 12, 1 and 3. Let's look at these verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So we don't have to grow weary or faint-hearted in this race that we're, we're running. We need to finish it well. I'm not a runner, and I know some of you may be, but you want to finish the race no matter what. The reassuring word of Christ to Smyrna is the word to all suffering, persecuted Christians, as stated in tw Hebrews 12, 11. Let's look at that verse. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. And so it, it's painful at the time, but it's going to be uh, proved to bring the fruit of righteousness. We, like the believers in Smyrna, must realize that God's economy is not the same as the world's. We can be afflicted, impoverished, and yet still be rich, just like the people in Smyrna. We must believe that Jesus rewards us eternally for our faithfulness. So you want to be faithful to the end. So believers need to realize that loving Jesus more than anything and repentance are what is required. Believers need to realize that God's idea of richness and blessing don't fit the world's definition. And the final realization, point three, is believers need to realize that even in the midst of evil, we can cling to Jesus. <clears throat> this is found in Revelation 2, 12 through 17. Follow along with me. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, Write the words of him who has a sharp, two-edged sword. I know, you were, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, 
my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have, you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have, have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now this passage may seem a little confusing, so let me break it down for you. Like Ephesus and Smyrna, Smyrna, it was a very wealthy city. There was also lots of uh, cults and witchcraft, but it was, and it was because it was very wicked. People in its pagan cults worshipped uh, Athena, Eclipius, Dionysus, and Zeus. I could probably slaughter those names. But the atmosphere of the city was adverse to any effective Christian life and testimony. It was kind of going against them when there was this spiritual darkness constantly going on. Pergamos had the first temple dedicated to Caesar, and he was a rabid promoter of imperial cult. This is probably what is meant by Satan's throne in Revelation 2.13. The city also had a temple dedicated to Eclepius, the god of healing, whose insignia was intertwined with a serpent on the staff. Maybe you recognize that as the medical symbol today, as it still is. And Satan, of course, is likewise symbolized as the serpent there, but it brought healing. That was a god that they worshipped. Like their brothers and sisters in Smyrna, the believers in Pergamos had suffered persecution, and one of their men, Antipas, had actually died for, for his faith. In spite of the intense suffering, this church had remained true to God. They refused to drop incense on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord. They wouldn't have any part of it. The accusation against the believers of Pergamos was that they had allowed a group of compromising people to infiltrate the church fellowship. And Jesus Christ hated their doctrines and their practices. That's why me and Pastor Mark have to be careful to not let uh, wolves slip in because they can ruin the fellowship of what's going on uh, in, in our church. These infiltrators are called Nicolaitans, whom we already talked about with the church of Ephesus. Remember the name means to rule the people. What they taught is called the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, the Hebrew name Balaam also means Lord of the people, and it's probably synonymous with the Nicolaitans. Sadly, this group of professed believers lorded it over the people, and they led them astray. Again, like the clergy or the laity, thinking that they had to go to them uh, instead of going straight to, to God. Just like the believers at Pergamos compromised, believers today also face the temptation to achieve personal advancement by ungodly compromise. We, we make decisions that go against what God says for uh, being liked or, or uh, advancement, maybe in job or career, whatever it may mean. The name Pergamus, Pergamus means Mary, reminding us that each local church is actually engaged to Christ and must be kept pure. Just like the church must be kept pure, we must stay pure. The church or the individual believer that compromises with the world just to avoid suffering or to achieve success is committing spiritual adultery and being unfaithful to the Lord. So we need to remember that, those successes. What are we going to compromise for success or, or relationships? From Revelation 2.16, Christ sharply rebuked the church with abrupt command, Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He promised that judgment would come soon, which also means suddenly. Christ would contend with them using the sword of his mouth. This again is the word of God, sharply judging all compromise and sin. And that's what he will also do with us. The final exhortation in verse 17 is to individuals. As in the messages to other churches is again addressed to those who are willing to hear. We must have willing ears to listen and to hear what God says to us. Overcomers are promised hidden manna and a white stone with a new name on it. What is all of that about? Well, the hidden manna may refer to Christ as the bread of heaven, the unseen source of the believer's nourishment and strength. Whereas Israel received physical food, manna, the church receives spiritual food. And as to the meaning of the white stone and the important 
point is the stone's inscription, which gives a believer a new name. It indicates acceptance of, by God and the title to his glory. So, as believers, we get a new name. We're a little Christ. We are Christians. We have the name of Christ. Maybe you've you have received that new name, but maybe you haven't. Maybe you're not a believer, so you don't have that new name. If you're not a believer, then you're not going to be accepted by God. He says that. This can change if you just receive, uh, surrender to Christ and be saved. When you surrender, you're actually willing to repent or turn away from your sin. You must believe by faith and trust that Jesus really did die on the cross. He was buried. He rose again on the third day, and he will be returning. That's what this book is about in Revelation, the return of Christ. When this happens, you get a new name, and God will accept you and give you the title to his glory. So, just as Jesus has powerful, life-changing words, we have his words at our own disposal, which are also powerful and world-changing. Pick up your Bible, read it, uh, try to go through the Bible, reading it each day, maybe chronologically. Get some time in God's Word, prayer, meditation. For our daily lives, we should learn to identify false teachings and use the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word, with grace and with strength. So, an application to our lives. Are you compromising your walk with Christ for pleasure? Let's look at those. Are you compromising your walk with Christ for pleasure or for success or avoiding suffering? If the answer is yes, what have you been compromising? What will you do to make things right? Are you willing to repent? That's what God calls the church to do. That's what God calls us to do. Are you keeping your relationship with Christ pure in every aspect of your life? What are some areas that might need to be uh, removed or some new choices, new direction in your life to keep that relationship pure. Has Satan been getting into your mind to twist things around so that you're not walking close to Christ? If yes, what are you going to do about it? Take some time to answer those questions in your own heart, in your own life. So, as we wrap up, believers need to realize that loving Jesus more than anything and repentance are what is required. Believers need to realize that God's idea of richness and blessing don't fit the world's definition. And believers need to realize that even in the midst of evil, we can cling to Jesus. To summarize, Jesus revealed in his letters to these churches in Asia that he knew what was going on. He knew that the Ephesians had abandoned their first love, that the church of Smyrna would soon suffer, and the Christians at Pergamum were following false teachers. We can find confidence and strength and faith in the fact that Jesus is all-knowing and all-powerful. Here's that general pattern for Jesus' letters to the churches we study today. And we'll see in the coming weeks that he, continue, that he actually continues this pattern for the seven letters. He says, I know, then I command you for, but I have this against you, and listen to what the Spirit says. So... How has the Holy Spirit been leading you to love, to forgive, to show mercy, to act, or to step out in faith lately? Will you commit to obey the Holy Spirit in His leading? What are you going to do about that? So, thanks for listening to me today, and I pray that you'll just continue to allow God to speak to your heart. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time to be in your Word in Revelation chapter 2. God, I pray that you'll just take each person's heart, God, that you'd change it, that you'd shape it, mold it more into your image. God, we just allow your Holy Spirit to convict us and then help us to obey what you've called us to. God, I pray for that one person who may not know you, God, that your Holy Spirit draw them to salvation, that they repent, that they surrender by faith and trust in you alone to save them. God, just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.